This episode of The Sweaty Penguin is brought to you by Salt Marshes. Do you wish marshes were salty? Try Salt Marshes today. Welcome to episode 74 of The Sweaty Penguin, Antarctica's hottest podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Brown. Today, we are talking about accounting, the field where 99% of us stop even trying the second we learn debit and credit are opposites. Seriously, how does that make sense? I have a debit card and a credit card, and I don't know if you've noticed, but they do pretty much exactly the same thing. We're not talking about any old accounting, though. We're talking about carbon accounting, a less developed branch of accounting that, rather than tracking money or inventory or Pokemons, tracks greenhouse gas emissions. Carbon accounting has a lot of promise, but right now it is going through some growing pains, not the least of which being that it is completely voluntary and doesn't have nearly the institutional structure that financial accounting has. We'll break all that down today, and I know accounting sounds dull, but I promise we'll keep the math to a minimum and have some fun. We'll discuss why carbon accounting matters, what challenges it's facing, and where we might go from here. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. If you want to take two minutes to help out The Sweaty Penguin, you can either leave us a five-star rating and review, or join our Patreon at patreon.com slash thesweatypenguin. Doing either earns you a special shout-out at the end of the show, joining the Patreon gets you merch, bonus content, and a whole lot more. First, it's time for Carbon Accounting 101. Actually, on second thought, that's probably not a 101 class. Let's start over. First, it's time for Carbon Accounting 556. According to the United Nations RED program, carbon accounting is the measuring of the additional greenhouse gases that are emitted into the atmosphere as a direct and indirect consequence of an activity, product, or organization. In other words, it's the act of keeping track of the greenhouse gases you emit, greenhouse gases being gases in the atmosphere that absorb solar radiation and warm the planet. Typically, this is in the context of companies, but the principles could be applied to cities, countries, or even the whole world. I know carbon accounting is named after the big dog, carbon, but there are actually seven greenhouse gases that carbon accounting tracks. Carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, sulfur hexafluoride, and nitrogen trifluoride. You got all that? Keep in mind, some of these are not one gas, but large categories of gases. That might sound overwhelming at first, but it's worth noting that one, companies absolutely can get this information. It's not as hard as rocket science or convincing Kanye to take an Instagram break. And two, if carbon dioxide and maybe methane or nitrous oxide sound way more familiar to you than the other gases I mentioned, there's a reason. Those first ones, and especially carbon, are way more prevalent than the others. That said, carbon dioxide is one of the least potent greenhouse gases. It's not as strong as the others when it comes to absorbing solar radiation. Carbon dioxide is Mark Wahlberg, methane is The Rock, and nitrous oxide is John Cena operating a forklift. To give you some context, According to the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, over a 100-year time span, methane has 28 times the global warming potential of CO2, nitrous oxide has 265 times the global warming potential, sulfur hexafluoride has 23,500 times the global warming potential, etc. By global warming potential, again, I mean the ability to absorb solar radiation and warm the planet. Now, don't get me wrong. Despite that, carbon dioxide is the biggest concern when it comes to greenhouse gases. 
a molecule of sulfur hexafluoride might be 23,500 times worse than a molecule of CO2, but we emit over 4 million times more CO2 than sulfur hexafluoride. It's like the Rams versus Bengals Super Bowl. It's not even a contest. Even with the refs blatantly ignoring T. Higgins committing blatant offensive pass interference on Jalen Ramsey in the opening play of the third quarter. So that begs the question. When we do carbon accounting, how do we put all these different gases into one sum total? How do we account for the fact that not every gas is made equal? Here's Green Collar Solutions' Ben Campbell on that question. How do we make meaningful comparisons between gases? In order to get around this problem, scientists use carbon dioxide as a benchmark for measuring the heat-trapping ability of each of the other greenhouse gases. Furthermore, to resolve the issue of different atmospheric lifetimes, a time span of 100 years is typically used in evaluating a gas's heat-trapping effect. So when we talk about global warming potential, or GWP, we can actually talk about this in a simpler way. Rather than saying X times worse than CO2 every time, we can use this GWP notation. Carbon dioxide is the benchmark, according to Ben. And that makes sense, as it's both the least potent gas and the most prevalent gas. Carbon dioxide gets a GWP of 1. Are you with me? Hang in there, we're almost done with math for the day, I promise. Not sending you to physics class right after this. Methane, we said, is 28 times worse than carbon dioxide, so methane gets a GWP of 28. Nitrous oxide is 265 times worse, so it gets a GWP of 265 and we can keep going down the list. So when a company does carbon accounting, when they tally up all their emissions, they give you one number. They'll add up all their carbon dioxide emissions and multiply it by one. Then they'll add up all their methane emissions and multiply it by 28. Then they'll add up all their nitrous oxide emissions and multiply it by 265 and they go down the rest of the list, and then they add up all these final totals, and that's their greenhouse gas emissions. The unit they use is called CO2e, or carbon dioxide equivalent, and it's saying their emissions are the equivalent of that much pure carbon dioxide. Again, this won't be a numbers-filled episode, we're really talking theory, but the idea of CO2e, the idea of global warming potential that uses a hundred-year time span, really is the glue that makes carbon accounting work. It's the answer to Ben's question of how do we make meaningful comparisons between greenhouse gases when one is thousands times worse than another. It's the same as if you put a hundred dollars, fifty euros, and a thousand pesos into your bank account. It's not immediately important what form all that takes, so you can just do a little math and say you have the equivalent of a little over two hundred dollars. The only difference is with greenhouse gases, you don't have a bank teller interrogating you. Okay, so that's what carbon accounting is. Before we get into some of the challenges, let's discuss the why of carbon accounting. I'll get to environmental reasons in a second, but first, let's go through a little thought exercise I actually went through myself as I wrote this. I thought to myself, is carbon as important to keep track of as money? And my gut said, no, probably not. Why? I don't know, we've always tracked money, we give it value, we get fined or even go to jail if we do it wrong. And carbon is just a gas that you can't buy a Slim Jim with. And I think most people would think that. But on second thought, money is something we made up. You know how we make fun of Bitcoins or NFTs? All currency is the same thing. They don't have cool Larry David commercials, although they probably should. But we all agreed that this green flimsy paper rectangle with a hundred has a significant amount of value. And rather than saying, hey, you give me 10 months of Netflix, I'll give you a bushel of pears, you can sell the pears, get that piece of paper, and use it at your convenience. So sure, 
We've got to keep track of that. We don't want to lose our pieces of paper unless a magician makes it disappear and reappear behind your ear. But they are just that. Pieces of paper. On the other hand, greenhouse gases are not made up. Not only are they real, but they are what allow us to survive and accumulate those pieces of paper. If you're growing pears and suddenly there's way too many greenhouse gases out there, now you've got climate change. And now it's too hot and there's pests and you can't grow pears. Now you can't get pieces of paper to buy 10 months of Netflix. Now you can't watch Tall Girl 2. And suddenly everything is spiraling. I'm not going to pretend carbon is everything to an economy. You've got human health, you've got education, you've got roads, you've got other natural resources such as biodiversity, water, food, energy, minerals, land. I'm just making the point that if we put this much effort into keeping track of money, which is a thing we made up, then it's not the worst idea to keep track of a real thing such as carbon. By no means is that a knock on money, I think it's a genius concept to not have to lug around bags of pears, but I want us to be honest with ourselves if we're going to compare one accounting against another. Alright, thought experiment over. Let's discuss some more concrete things too. Economically, we talked as recently as two weeks ago about how environmentally conscious companies are more profitable. Companies are finding that carbon accounting is a way to attract investors and show the public their commitment to climate change, which drives revenue. About 90% of companies in the S&P 500 now issue some form of environmental, social, and governance report, almost always including an estimate of the company's greenhouse gas emissions. I guess the other 10% just issue a statement saying, don't worry, we use oat milk in our coffee. And environmentally... Think about all these companies and countries saying, we're going carbon neutral. Better yet, we are carbon neutral. How do you know? You need to keep track. Even if you're not there yet, even if you're not planning to go carbon neutral at the moment, you still want to know what your biggest sources of emissions are. You can improve them and reap the benefits. So between the environmental and economic benefits of carbon accounting and the fact that it just seems like something a civilized society would do, like leaving your shoes on while riding an airplane, you'd think we'd be pretty enthusiastic about carbon accounting, right? Unfortunately, according to Carbon Alt Delete's Kenneth Vandenberg, we're well behind the eight ball. Today, carbon accounting is kind of a toddler, but it needs to become a grown-up over the coming years. What do I mean with that? Let's take the example of financial accounting again. In financial accounting, there are very clear international rules on how to report on the financial performance of a company. And when a company reports on its financial performance, an independent third party comes in to review their books and make sure that everything is done properly. We're not yet there for carbon accounting. These strict rules processes are not yet in place for carbon accounting. Carbon accounting is a toddler. It needs to become a grown-up. If we take the S&P 500 again, we said 90% of the companies do environmental, social, and governance reports. But only 52% use an outside firm to verify it. And regardless of whether or not the company was accurate, they'll be praised just for trying. That's right. Everyone gets orange slices and a trophy. On hot days, they'll even get popsicles. Thanks, Braden's mom. According to a piece in Harvard Business Review, with no accountability, companies routinely present metrics that paint them in a better light, which then leads to a slippery slope where people perceive all of these reports to just be greenwashing in a tuxedo. That's a whole lot different from money, where if you mess up, you might be looking at jail time. Now, I'm not saying throw executives in jail today for misrepresenting their carbon emissions, and I don't think Kenneth is either. If there are still companies who don't do carbon accounting at all, then you have no grounds to issue a punishment to those who do. But that's a really big dichotomy between carbon and money. 
And just like a country needs to keep track of everyone's money in order to collect taxes and all that fun stuff, they need to keep track of greenhouse gases to protect their environment, economy, and achieve and uphold the carbon neutral promises they made at the United Nations. Without those numbers, not much they can do. That's why, according to Kenneth, carbon deserves the same attention as money, and right now, we're a very far cry from that. Now, there is an international standard for carbon accounting called the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, and that's something. Everyone's got the same global warming potentials to multiply by, and 116 pages of other stuff to read and do. Sounds fun, right? But even though this standard exists, one, it isn't the law of the land, no one even enforces that companies or countries do it, let alone do it correctly, and two, it has some challenges of its own. So what are those challenges? First, let's talk about something called Scope 3 Emissions. If you remember all the way back to episode 25 on carbon neutrality in fall 2020, which I'm sure you do, you'll remember that there are three types of emissions. Scope 1 accounts for all on-site emissions, such as gas boilers, air conditioning leaks, and on-site company-owned vehicles. Pretty easy to keep track of. Scope 2 accounts for indirect energy emissions, mainly electricity. You might be wondering, why is electricity indirect? Well, if you were burning coal in the parking lot to fuel your building, it would be direct, but you probably don't do that unless you like your office smelling like a dive bar. Rather, the electricity emissions from any fossil fuels are occurring far away at power plants or compressor stations or what have you. They're indirect. They're off-site. That makes them scope two. Also easy to track, just check the electric bill. Scope three is the largest and most difficult category to track and calculate. This is all other indirect emissions resulting from the activities of a company. As a completely random example, and not picking on anyone or claiming I know their supply chain, let's say you own a large cookie company, a cookie conglomerate. You have your scope 1 emissions at the factory, you have scope 2 emissions providing electricity, but that barely scratches the surface. You have the emissions from tractors, nitrogen fertilizers, land conversion, etc. that went into growing the wheat and turning it into flour, growing the sugar cane and turning it into sugar, growing the corn to create corn syrup, growing the cocoa to create chocolate, growing the oil palms to obtain palm oil. You have the emissions to obtain whatever plastics, metals, papers, or other materials are in your wrappers. You have the emissions to transport all of these raw ingredients and materials to the factory. You have the emissions from the cars of your factory workers as they drive themselves to and from work, minus the guy who always bikes to work and shows up sweaty. You have the emissions to transport all of the baked and packaged cookies out of the factory to the grocery stores. You even have the emissions of the wrappers ending up in a landfill and releasing whatever gross gas it ultimately decomposes into. And I hope I made a solid dent in Cookie's Scope 3 emissions there, but I very well may have missed a bunch of things. But that's a lot of emissions, right? In fact, Scope 3 can account for up to 80% of an organization's emissions. And according to Vital Metrics reporting analyst Katie Day, companies don't have to report these. The emissions are separated by category as either direct emissions from operations owned or controlled by the company, or indirect emissions from sources owned or controlled by another company. For indirect emissions, only those from purchased electricity are required to be included, although companies are encouraged to include supply chain emissions. Under the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, the standard for international carbon accounting, the largest category of emissions are encouraged? Really? Look, I get why direct emissions are the priority. They're the easiest to track and easiest to control. But as ridiculous as it sounds to track the emissions from all these different sources, think about it. You accounted for how much you paid to get the flour, the sugar, the chocolate, the corn syrup, the palm oil. 
you accounted for when you sold the cookies to the grocery store. If you can keep track of the money, you can keep track of the carbon. It's really not that different. Keep in mind, experts know or can calculate how many emissions come from each activity in the supply chain. There are online resources, there are firms that will do it for you. And once you get the number once, you never have to get it again, unless you throw out the napkin you wrote it on. So even that is pretty straightforward. That's why, when I heard Katie express that tracking this really major type of emissions is just encouraged and not required, I was a bit surprised. And if we want to talk about greenwashing, which I wish we didn't have to, greenwashing becomes really easy when you don't have to track scope 3. Let's go back to our cookie company. What if, instead of owning our factories, we found someone else who owns a factory, and we contracted them to make the cookies and sell them to us. Suddenly, the scope 1 and 2 emissions from the factory become scope 3. In fact, we can peel everything away except, say, our corporate headquarters, where we can get a LED certification, slap on some solar panels, do a few more things, make some TikToks about it, and suddenly we're a carbon-neutral company in the eyes of the greenhouse gas protocol. That might sound ridiculous, but there are several major companies today who have basically done the equivalent of that, and claim today to be carbon neutral. And speaking of carbon neutral, I also want to quickly discuss carbon offsets. I'm not going to get into this in detail, because we've talked about it before, and it's honestly a separate issue. But carbon offsets are essentially credits you can buy that reduce your carbon footprint. If you're flying from LA to New York, for example, First off, I know it's nice out today, but it's still winter, don't do that. But if you did make that flight, you'd emit 0.662 tons of carbon, according to myclimate.org. If you want your trip to be carbon neutral, the theory is you can pay to have that carbon removed. On that site, it says you can pay 20 bucks to support a project that will either suck 0.662 tons of carbon out of the atmosphere via tree planting, or prevent 0.662 tons of carbon from entering the atmosphere that otherwise would have. This is very often a clean energy or energy efficiency project. Typically, we think of carbon offsetting as something companies or countries would do to meet their carbon neutral targets once they've cut all the emissions they can. But increasingly, carbon offsets have become available to individuals as well, as Klima CEO Marcus Gillis demonstrates. We have launched Klima in December uh, last year. We are now 5,000 users, and those 5,000 users have already taken out 20,000 tons of CO2 equivalents out of the atmosphere. 5,000 users might not be earth-shattering, but for such a new company, that certainly shows a strong interest in carbon offsetting from the general public. The problem lies where he says they've taken 20,000 tons of CO2e out of the atmosphere. Have they? Have they really? In all fairness, the answer might be yes. I'm certainly not singling out this one company. But think about what you're really saying here. If your 20 bucks went to planting a tree, for example, are we sure that tree would not have been planted if you hadn't paid 20 bucks? That that's always and forever your tree representing your flight? Are we sure that that tree won't get cut down or burnt up in a wildfire or something that re-releases the carbon you intended to offset? That the tree will never die? That you and your tree will live happily ever after? And if we're talking about solar panels or better cook stoves or what have you, I'm sure many of these projects are fantastic. But again, would this community have never upgraded their technology in the next decades if it weren't for your 20 bucks? More importantly, would this project actually suck your carbon out of the atmosphere? This isn't even getting into how for all of these projects, you have to ask do the communities involved, largely in the global south, actually want these projects. In many communities, projects have been actively protested. So in terms of carbon accounting for a larger company, when they're bankrolling projects like these and want to claim that they're carbon neutral because they offset their emissions, 
there's a ridiculous number of questions to ask, and some of them might be unanswerable. It's like asking, can you yawn while you sleep? Or do dentists go to other dentists? It's impossible to know. As great an idea as carbon offsets are, and a seemingly popular one given Klima's early success, they're really challenging to rely on, and that gets into a whole other conversation about how to account for them. So is carbon accounting hopeless? Is it just fancy greenwashing? Absolutely not. It's just a very new concept that is going through some growing pains right now, but ultimately has a lot of potential to make humanity a lot more organized and sustainable. So where do we go from here? Well, you might like the idea of carbon accounting being just a voluntary, look at me, I'm sustainable thing. But if you see it as essential and helpful to keep track of carbon on a wide scale, there has to be a bit of a legal jump. This isn't just slapping regulations onto companies, but actually creating the infrastructure to manage carbon accounting at a national and international scale. Does carbon get an equivalent of the Department of Treasury? Does carbon get an equivalent of the IRS? Does carbon get its own Angela Martin? I know that sounds overwhelming when I say it, but I really don't think it's the overhaul of society it sounds like. Tracking carbon and tracking money are quite similar, and since we know how to do it for one, we can really just do a copy-paste for lack of a better word. I don't think accountants would be hurt if we plagiarized them. Obviously, be it regulations or institutions, additional government oversight has plenty of drawbacks, but if done right, the economic benefits could outweigh the drawbacks. It also makes it easier on the companies who are doing it to be part of a well-organized system. There's also ideas to make carbon accounting easier. As we ease into a more formal system, companies can get a good estimate of scope 3 even without the cooperation of the rest of their supply chain, as Vital Metrics data analyst Summer Broke Smith explains. Typically, organizations find that just a few of those 15 scope 3 categories really dominate their total supply chain emissions. So here's an example here um, from a company that Vital Metrics worked with last year. They were a leading international provider of heating, cooling, and refrigeration equipment. Uh, and we helped them quantify their scope 3 uh, emissions for their CDP report. Uh, you can see that purchased goods and services comprise the overwhelming majority of their scope 3 emissions. Even though there are 15 categories of scope 3 emissions, in Summer's experience, it's very common to find companies that overwhelmingly live within one or a few of these categories. It's like perusing the Cheesecake Factory menu. There might be 15 categories of food, but you'll probably skip the fish entrees and do most of your ordering within burgers and flatbreads. Long term, I think the goal is to calculate all of them, and for that to be as routine a practice as counting all the money in your bank account. But especially if carbon accounting is voluntary as it is now, it's a lot better to calculate the biggest sources of scope 3 emissions than to ignore them. Companies don't have to twiddle their thumbs for the government to come up with a large-scale plan. They can absolutely take this step. And by tracking those big emission sources, which Summer says dominate a company's supply chain, then companies can start making emissions cuts much more quickly. What about longer-term ideas? I certainly don't have time to get into a lot, in part because it's a little over my head seeing as I'm not an accountant. But I'll share one cool idea we found in the Harvard Business Review called e-liabilities. If we compare to money for the thousandth time, the same money goes through the hands of many different companies. Since each company has a markup, the amount of money exchanging hands grows along the supply chain. For example, the cocoa farmer gets money from the middleman, who gets money from the warehouse, and the list goes on until we reach our beloved cookie company, who then gets money from the grocery store, who gets money from the consumer, who gets money from the nerd in the cafeteria. Each person has that money on the books. Well, maybe not the cafeteria bully. I'm guessing they're not reporting wedgies on their tax returns. Right now, this system isn't the case for carbon. You can't currently transfer emissions to others in the greenhouse gas protocol, which is an ideal. That's where the e-liabilities idea could come in. 
When you buy your chocolate chips or whatever, you'd get an amount of carbon emissions from your supplier that are now on your books. When you sell your cookies to a grocery store, you'd add the carbon you emitted, basically a markup, and then transfer those emissions to the store. When the store sells your cookies, they'd transfer the emissions to the customer. In a sense, this is like balancing the books. You want to make sure the emissions you bring in, plus the emissions you create, equal the emissions you transfer. Now I'm sure companies will still find loopholes in this system, so I don't want to act like it's perfect, but I do think it takes away some of the incentive to do that. If the carbon ends up on everyone's books in the supply chain, it's no longer a blame game. It's not like you're the only company with a given carbon molecule on its books, and it's in your best interest to weasel out of recording it. Instead, it's purely about tracing the carbon through the supply chain, and while everyone will be incentivized to reduce their carbon, no one is necessarily feeling blamed. The other piece is carbon offsets, which could go a number of different directions. Some suggest simply managing them better, others suggest making them illegal, some feel actual mechanical sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it underground is the only true offset, others feel more natural projects are ultimately better, even if a little suboptimal. We've covered some of this in past episodes, and we'll continue to cover it in future episodes, so I won't get into detail here, but it's absolutely worth considering how carbon offsetting and carbon accounting can find ways to work in tandem. Now, if you didn't get all that, that's totally fine. This was even confusing for me, so I won't be surprised if you feel similarly. But even if the details are a little tricky, I hope the big picture is clear. It just makes sense to track carbon and we're really far from doing it well. That said, given the benefits of doing it, and the fact that companies are already voluntarily moving in that direction, I'm absolutely optimistic it can be done. Because if we do, we'll be a more organized society, improve the climate, help the economy, and maybe give Kanye something happier to post about on Instagram. Do you wish coastal ecosystems were, like, super passive-aggressive? If so, salt marshes are for you. Not only are salt marshes salty, but they're actually one of the key ecosystems in protecting us from climate change, even as they get inundated by sea level rise and tropical storms. Huh, I guess that's why they're salty then. Salt marshes. Because Mother Nature isn't nice enough to make us sugar marshes. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Welcome back to The Sweaty Penguin. With me today is Dr. Delphine Jabassier, Associate Professor of Finance at Audencia Business School in France. Dr. Jabassier, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be with you today. So I see your educational background was very much on the business and accounting side. So tell us a bit about your background and what led you to decide to use that experience in the context of sustainability in the environment. Well, actually, it started the other way around. So I have been interested in the environment since I was a kid. I was interested like a kid would be interested in nature. And then I became an accountant by training afterwards. And it made sense for me to bring them both together when by being a controller, I found that there was little meaning to my job, which was basically helping my company make more money. And that was nice, but that was just not not making sense anymore. So that was back in yeah, 12, 12, 13 years ago already, 14 years ago. Yeah. So at least from my limited sample size, I hear a lot of people in the environmental world express skepticism when it comes to carbon accounting. People feel countries and companies will just fudge the numbers, they won't be held accountable and so on. And that's tough because as challenging as carbon accounting is, if we're going to talk about climate progress in terms of carbon neutral targets, we need carbon accounting. We need a way to track that. So what do you think? Are you optimistic that we can get good at carbon accounting and do it sincerely? There is a lot of practice and a lot of 
maturity in the way that we should do it. Now, the problem is practice. It's not the accounting itself. It's about how companies do it and potentially at the moment without any regulation or little regulation, because there is some states have regulated it already, including in France, but without a real accountability system, auditability system, you will always get people trying to do something different than what actually the rules or the standards tells you to do. You can have a different perimeter. You can count offsets and avoided emissions when it's not allowed and kind of do a mix of things. You can, you know, there's lots of ways to not report the exact numbers or change the way that you report your targets or your absolute versus intensity numbers. But even in accounting, we have people playing with numbers. Right? So we know that it's easy to do. And at the moment, without that regulation, it will continue to, to, to be that way. Yeah. And talking about those standards, the greenhouse gas protocol corporate standard seems to be the main carbon accounting system being used. But you've written about the example with Danon, where they decided to kind of create their own system. Do you feel it's important for there to be one system that everyone's using? Or can companies kind of have that freedom? Because it seems like it would be a lot more difficult to kind of audit and track across the board if people are doing different things. Today, there is, I would say, mainly one rule worldwide to calculate GHG emissions. The particular case of Danone dates back from 2006, 2007, when they started and when there was still questions about what to do. And basically what they created is not really their own standards. They also wanted to create a system close to what we do in management accounting, which would allow them to reduce. It was not just, let's put a number out in, the, in a nice report. It was, what can we do to reduce? And there was also a discussion that is still ongoing today, but about how do we communicate that to consumers? So they had built a system which was product-based rather than site-based and institution company-based. But basically, we also worked on making it compatible in the end. And we managed because if you have Apple, if you count it one way or the other way, in the end, it's an Apple and then it, you bring it together. But yes, to be able to compare, to be able to be transparent and accountable to the public, to the state, to the investors and all stakeholders, you need one standard. One of the challenges of carbon accounting that sounds really daunting to me is tracking scope three emissions, all these indirect things that don't happen on site. And I can't fathom actually keeping track of it all. So to what extent can these scope three emissions be tracked or at the very least estimated? I think we are growing in maturity in terms of data collections. Uh, transportation, it's about kilometers. It's about knowing whether it goes through plane or through train. And that, you know, in a company, you know, you can't say you don't. You actually know how a T-shirt comes to you, how the food comes to you. So you you have those information. The problem is often it's in another software. It's in an Excel sheet. And the difficulty is to bring it back to a full accounting system. It's the same for ingredients. You know what you buy to make a yogurt or to make a T-shirt. You buy different things, colors, etc. But you know, you have that in the production systems. You have that in the purchasing systems. You collect the price information mainly, sometimes the kilos, the little stuff, but not often. And that's actually what we need. We need that rather than the price. So what I often say about scope three is that it's possible. What I find a bit annoying from companies is that they all now want to do something about their emissions. But when we are telling them there is a little bit of difficulty, meaning that they will have to invest into people and IT systems, they go back and say, oh, but maybe no. <laughs> so you got to know that it's about your own company's survival. And I know we'll talk about that a bit later, but you've got to do it. So you've got to invest. And you can start with the what we call the most material, the biggest impact, and then slowly move to the ones that are hidden and more difficult to access. 
but you can't say you don't know. You have the information somewhere. So a lot of institutions will use carbon offsets as a way to compensate for carbon they emit, things like planting trees, investing in clean energy projects. And as exciting as these projects are, I know there's often cases of carbon offsets being double counted or someone takes credit for a project that would have happened without their intervention. And it seems to me like really good carbon accounting could be kind of where these issues get ironed out. Are our current carbon accounting systems equipped to reliably keep track of carbon offsets? I think this is a very different topic. You've got to count and report on your own emissions first. That's key. And you've got to reduce your own emission in an absolute manner on scope one, two, and three first with and by using science-based targets. That's really the the key elements that companies should uh, focus on. Once you have done that, what we see is companies and countries having carbon neutrality targets, which is when offsets could come in. You have to remember any offsets that you are making is to contribute to worldwide neutrality. It's not to contribute to your own neutrality. And it's really important to think about it as a contribution to global warming rather than uh, to your own own little piece of the cake. But yes, there has been a lot of damage being done to people trusting carbon accounting because of the offsets. But that's also because the people who misinterpret or misuse offsets also haven't reduced on their own side first. And that's a real change in in attitude that we need to have. So uh, you've got to be very careful with what you do when you're talking about offsets. Last resort, I'd say. Who holds companies or countries, for that matter, accountable for reporting their carbon accurately? How much verification is necessary? Much more than we have today. (laughs) It's the same importance because company will die of of climate change and some already have because of insurance that uh, didn't imagine that climate change would do so much damage or electricity companies in some countries have already been victims of climate change. It's not written on their obituary, (laughs) but it's actually already the case. So It's a matter of life or death of of business now to deal with climate change. So it will be as important that their accounting is as neat and verifiable and audited as, as what we do in finance. You also work on sustainability accounting, water accounting, biodiversity accounting. Could you give us a little overview of some of these other environmental accounting areas you work on and where do we stand with them in relation to carbon accounting? Basically, if you want to do really good accounting, you also need really good science behind. So for climate, we have the IPCC. For biodiversity, we have the IPBES that came into play a few years ago and has been really demonstrating A, the importance, B, the state of science in terms of where we are for biodiversity. And for water, we don't have that. We have global arenas but we don't have a global institution that can say, this is the state of water, this is where we need to go. And it's important because right now, a lot of the accounting that we do is incrementally. So we are going to try and reduce and do better than the day before. What is really important is to know the state of water locally and globally as a planetary boundary is like to have something like the 1.5 degrees of the Paris Agreement, but for water, we don't have that for water. We don't really have that for biodiversity, but we have some science coming to to know where we should go. And that would be the most important because right now we say, let's reduce water pollution. Let's be careful of water scarcity, but we don't know where we should be at. And that's the difference between reducing without a target and reducing with a science-based target. So in terms of water we have, in terms of biodiversity, we are very far from knowing how to do it. Dr. Jubas here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This wraps up episode 74 of The Sweaty Penguin. Take two minutes, help out the show, and get a shout out at the end of the show by leaving a five-star rating and a review on Apple or Podcast Addict, 
or join our Patreon at patreon.com slash the sweaty penguin. You get merch, bonus content, and more. Clips today came from Ben Campbell, TEDx Talks, Vital Metrics Group, and CNBC. Special thanks to our Emperor Penguin patrons, Lawrence Harris and Brownie Central. The Sweaty Penguin is presented by Peril and Promise, a public media initiative from the WNET Group in New York, reporting on the issues and solutions around climate change. You can learn more at pbs.org slash perilandpromise. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next week.